everyone. My name is Sarah Lynn Bowman from the Transformative Play Initiative at the Department of Game Design at Uppsala University. Today, we're going to give an introduction to transformative role-playing games, which is followed by several other videos that you can find on our YouTube site for more information. So like all of our videos, we like to start with um, some definitions. So what is a role-playing game? Role-playing games are co-creative experiences where participants immerse into fictional characters and realities for a bounded period of time through emergent playfulness. Um, this activity creates a magic circle of play in which the social and physical rules of reality differ from everyday life. And while props and costumes may exist, this fiction exists mostly in the minds of the other participants, which is a term we call subjective diegesis. The audience members are also its participants and co-creators, which means that role-playing has what's called a first-person audience. And while fantasy, science fiction, and post-apocalyptic fiction are common, role-playing games can be any genre, setting, or theme. So there's three main types of role-playing. There's virtual or digital role-playing, and that's text-based or graphical, uh, usually through a computer interface of some sort, and it can be single player or multiplayer. There's tabletop role-playing, usually played sitting at a table, sometimes with dice, character sheets, and miniatures. This is less physical and more verbal. And then there's live action role-playing games or LARPs. And that's where uh, players physically embody the role-playing, sometimes with costumes, props, and other special locations. And um, LARPs and tabletops can be played online. That's a slightly different uh, thing. Um, when we talk about digital role-playing, we're mainly concerned with digital games that are um, role-playing game themed. So like MMORPGs. Um, Today, we're gonna to focus on tabletop and live action role-playing. So we're gonna be thinking about games that are analog rather than digital. So at their core, there are three main functions of role-playing games, uh, as I've described in my book. There are, uh, there's first community creation, uh, and this can take the form of things like enactment of rituals together. Um, the game itself brings people together. There's skill training, so scenario building, problem solving, practicing pro-social behaviors. That's gonna be a big one for us today, especially as we talk about educational and therapeutic LARP. And then identity exploration. So for example, uh, exploring a different or alternative gender, but there's many ways that we can explore different parts of our identity as we will see. So role-playing games create space for participants to experience a greater sense of agency, a greater sense of empowerment. Uh, so feeling like they can actually make change in the world and they, they can make meaningful choices that matter. And that's connected to what we call the internal locus of control. Uh, so in psychology, um, if you have an internal locus of control, it means that you feel like you can um, actually, that the world isn't happening to you that you are an agent within it. Whereas if you have this external locus of troll, control, sometimes you can feel like um, the world is acting upon you all of the time. And of course, both are, are partially true, uh, but internal locus of control is often tied to well being. So, role playing games can create space for participants to experiment with social roles um, and to collaborate to engage in perspective taking. So actually taking on the role of uh, what someone imagines another perspective would be like, another person's uh, reality, and perhaps gaining more empathy for other people who have a different lived experience as a result of this perspective taking. And then finally, uh, it opens a space for what's called meta reflection. So because we're playing both a player and a character at the same time, and we're engaging in what we would consider reality and fiction at the same time, there's a space that opens up where reflection can occur. And this reflection can happen before a game, it can sometimes happen during a game, although often we're very overwhelmed and focused on the game itself, uh, but often it happens after the game. 
And we're going to emphasize that, particularly in talking about transformative role playing games. So, what is transformation? This is a question that uh, we get asked a lot at the Transformative Play Initiative. Um, and here are some definitions that we've come up with. So these are our definitions of transformation. They, you may find others out there, that's fine, but it's good for us to establish the assumptions that we're working from. So our first step definition is that transformation is a prolonged and sustained state of change. Our second definition is that transformation is a process or series of processes that lead to growth. So when inspired by role-playing experiences, transformation can be a state that alters a person's view of themselves, of others, or of the world in significant ways. So when we talk about role-playing as a state, what we really mean is this is an altered state of consciousness. And we do return back from it, but if we come back um, with a significant change, then we can say, say that we've been transformed in some way by the experience. Um, it could be, this transformation could be a state that shifts the way a person relates to others interpersonally and or a state that has the potential to shift social and cultural dynamics in ways that build towards greater awareness, joy, peace, and justice. So we're, there's lots of types of transformation. Um, games can be transformative in ways that we consider positive and ways that we don't. Um, but we're deeply interested in uh, games that foster these kinds of progressive values and states of being. So let's talk about this first definition, transformation as a prolonged and sustained state of change. It's a shift in a consciousness that has lasting after effects. It remains prolonged and sustained long after the game has concluded. That doesn't mean that one shifts consciousness um, into a character and doesn't leave the character. But what it means is this shift in consciousness has somehow transformed the way that we view reality when we come back out of the game. And some examples of that um, might be affected by uh, playing a game, a person might have a change in the way that they view themselves, their identity, how they view reality, their paradigm, how they view others and, and interact with others, their relationships, how they view society, including its structures, their place within those structures, and the roles of others within those structures. And then how the player views cultures, subcultures, and countercultural movements. As Janea Kemper puts it, role-playing games allow us to weird the self, meaning we consciously transmute our identities through intentional play. And this intentionality that we're talking about here is called steering. So Sometimes these effects that we're going to talk about are more accidental, and sometimes we can actually steer towards them consciously in play. And um, part of the goal of studying transformative game design is figuring out how to more intentionally create these transformational experiences or open space for them, at least, as we will see. So our view of transformation, as I said, is inherently progressive. Uh, we are interested in using role-playing games as a medium to help people progress from one state to another that is more beneficial both to the individual and to the group. We are interested in committing to processes of change that are necessary for personal and social growth. We want to work to reduce suffering in people and in others and help improve overall well-being. We want to help people align with a sense of purpose, meaning, and authenticity whenever possible. And we want to help people connect with other people in ways that will build confidence and trust in the hopes of renewing faith in the human capacity for care and support. 
Uh, now, these might seem very lofty goals, but at the Transformative Play Initiative, we think they're worth going towards. Role-playing games hold the potential to provide a vehicle for change processes to occur for all participants, including the designers and the facilitators. So what do we mean when we say a vehicle for change processes? Well, on one level, any activity, including leisure role-playing games, i.e. games that are not uh, created for some sort of transformational impact necessarily, they can be educational or therapeutic in some way. Uh, often this is accidental or as a side effect of participation. Of participation. Um, and in some cases, participants might be primed for transformation based on other things that are happening in their lives. And the role-playing experience acts as a catalyst. So the game itself is not what causes the change, but it sort of activates processes that maybe were already dormant and just needed a little push. So at the Transformative Play Initiative, we prefer to use the term transformative as a broad term for these kinds of long-term changes that might occur after a game. And here's a quote by Michal Muchowski, who is an EduLARP scholar. He says, I'd argue that LARP doesn't transform people, it opens for transformation. A well-designed game can be a great beginning, but no more than a beginning. It has to be followed either with more role plays in order to make it a repeated, not singular experience, or with equally well-designed, reflective and creative activities. And so this, this process of reflection and creation afterwards is part of what keeps that spark of transformation going. So transformative being this broad term that, that covers all of these things, we further distinguish between leisure, educational and therapeutic games in the following ways. Leisure role-playing games are designed and played for a variety of reasons, mostly personal and individualized, even if the game has a specific goal in mind. So these are voluntary games that are played in one's free time and people may have very different reasons for why they decided to attend that game or what sorts of things that they enjoy within it. Now, educational role-playing games are designed and played with explicit and or implicit educational goals in mind. So those goals may be learning objectives that are told to the participants ahead of time, or they may be baked into the LARP and, or the tabletop in some sort of way that isn't necessarily transparent. Educational role-playing games might be voluntary, but they are often mandatory. Uh, for example, if they are performed in classrooms during school time, then that is a mandatory activity. Now, therapeutic role-playing games are designed and played with explicit therapeutic goals in mind. Um, and they tend to be facilitated with emotional support from a mental health paraprofessional or professional. So for example, a coach, a therapist, a social worker, a mental aid, a uh, mental health first aid worker, a community healer, et cetera. So people that have some sort of background in helping people through processes like these. Therapeutic games might be voluntary, but they are sometimes mandatory, uh, such as when they're required by one's parents or by the court system. And also there may be crossover between these types of games. For example, a leisure LARP having on-site support from a psychotherapist, that sometimes happens, or a therapeutic LARP that also guides participants to learn social skills and emotional intelligence through practice. And we're gonna talk more about that later. All right, so let's start with that first category, which is leisure role-playing games. So leisure role-playing games, um, are distinguished from work. Leisure is distinguished from work as an activity. Uh, it tends to be an activity that somebody per does in their spare time and does not get paid to do. Leisure is often associated with playfulness as a counterpoint to work. 
However, some leisure activities are associated with states of flow, which are these energized, hyper-focused on one particular action that's challenging and requires skill states. Uh, so for example, in one's leisure time, they may be learning to play the violin, and that's a very difficult uh, uh, hobby to have, but it's still considered a leisure activity. In addition, many ro role players engage in labor in order to make games, games happen. In fact, there are a lot of LARPs that probably would never have happened if it wasn't for a large amount of often volunteer labor on the part of participants. And this can include designers, facilitators, and players. So for example, in uh, your typical Dungeons and Dragons game, the game master often performs quite a bit of labor. They are responsible for knowing all the rules, you know, knowing where things are in the rule books, um, and also creating a narrative of some sort for them to follow and um, responding on the fly. So creating characters, you know, mapping out the world, that sort of thing. And then, you know, even in combat in Dungeons and Dragons can be quite complex and it can include a lot of math. Um, so I mean, people are not only playing, but they're also engaging in their math skills and things like that. And so some types of labor that are often, uh, that often happen in leisure role-playing games are physical labor, emotional labor, and creative labor. So our role-playing games can become somewhat of a second job for passionate members of the community. Some even perform their own jobs in the role-playing games. So they go to work and do their job and then they play uh, a similar version of, of what they do at work in the game. So an example of this is real life teachers instructing fi fictional students at a wizard school. And so the kinds of labor that we're talking about here can range in activities. It could be preparing plots, set design, costuming, uh, props, fleshing out characters, lore, backstory, could be cooking, physically cooking, performing, or creating special scenes such as in-game rituals, and then also helping players process emotions, which can be quite a lot of work. And an example of this are the quote unquote downstairs laborers in the LARP Fairweather Manor, who literally served the upstairs upper class in a large mansion. And so the people playing the um, downstairs servants had to learn how to master the castle. They had to um, do a lot of physical labor in game uh, and that was quite arduous. And so there are a lot of LARPs that, that include this kind of physical activity. Uh, that is expected. So what distinguishes leisure role-playing games from professionals? This varies, but in general, uh, the goals. Participants engage in leisure role-playing in their free time, and they have various reasons for doing so. Those reasons can range from uh, quote-unquote entertainment uh, to social connection to self-actualization. And these goals do not always overlap. So some players insist that games are just for fun or ent entertainment or escapism, which kind of downplays their meaning. And other players find profound meaning in these experiences and intentionally use them for personal and social development. So I would say that even players who are only intended, intending to experience quote unquote fun are often engaging in learning and practicing skills as necessary parts of the structure of games. So going back to our Dungeons and Dragons uh, example, uh, one has to learn basic math in order to be able to play the game, unless some, you're using some sort of system online that crunches the numbers for you, for example, which I do know exist. But for the most part, there's an expectation that you're actually gonna be practicing math skills in that game. And then um, leisure games are often played in non-professional spaces, meaning not the places that people work. So it could be a home, it could be a hotel conference room, it could be a rented vacation location like a castle. And then social rules. So um, often someone is playing their off work leisure identity rather than uh, their work 
uh, identity. And so they aren't necessarily invoking the responsibilities that they have as a professional. So for example, uh, in the wizard school LARP example that I gave earlier, some of the teachers enjoyed playing bad teachers <laughs> in the LARP, that that was somehow cathartic or fun for them. However, many of the benefits of role-playing in professional contexts are also often experienced in leisure ones. Uh, and more. And I would say that there are lots and lots and lots of benefits uh, of role-playing games. We're just going to cover a few today. So ritual anthropologist Victor Turner emphasized how leisure activities are actually the exercising of an individual's freedom, of their growing self-mastery, and even self-transcendence. That they are imbued with pleasure in ways that other expected activities such as work are not, and that they're potentially capable of releasing creative powers, individual or communal, either to criticize or buttress the dominant social structural values. So even though these activities are taking part uh, in one's spare time, they have the potential to actually shift reality, either criticize it or buttress it in terms of um, its values. Thus, professional role-playing activities that emerge from leisure communities are often imbued with these qualities as well. So people who um, decide to professionalize coming out of these role-playing communities often are taking some of the fun or whatever we, we want to call it with them. This um, this leisure uh, magic, if, if you want to say that. And so they're adding qualities such as new and interesting types and dynamics of play. So perhaps they know more about how to make a game complex. Uh, they may add mechanics, meta techniques, safety structures, and other best practices. So this is really the space that we're interested in here in the transformative play initiative is this in-between space between uh, leisure and more professional activities. So applied role-playing games, that's what we mean by this professional space. So there are a lot of examples of settings where role-playing activities are already taking place. Um, so we're just going to give you a few of them. Uh, there's professional training, such as leadership, leadership and teamwork in business simulations, teacher training, such as, um, you know, teaching the teacher, basically, organizational development. And then there are educational interventions, such as classroom settings, experiential learning, drama and education, field trips, and interactive museum exhibits. There's crisis management, so first responder training, military simulations, future scenarios, contingency planning, and mental health first aid. So you see a lot of role playing in crisis management, management specifically because you can't learn how to deal with a crisis from a PowerPoint or a book. You have to put yourself into embodied practice in some way. Um, and it's better to learn uh, in a practice scenario than it is to learn in the field uh, where the stakes are much higher. Similarly, then we have healthcare with uh, medical teaching simulations and physical therapy, uh, therapeutic interventions such as drama therapy, psychodrama, gestalt, narrative therapy, therapy uh, trauma recovery and re rehabilitation. And then we have personal development. So spiritual guidance, self-improvement workshops, well-being interventions, social skill acquisition groups, that sort of thing. And then finally, we have community outreach. So youth camps, activism, aid work, and conflict transformation. And an example of that is um, graduate students from George Mason's University's School for Conflict Analysis and Resolution. Um, they engaged in this role-playing uh, activity where they were peace builders providing aid to civilians during a civil war. Uh, and this scenario was designed by the Forage Center. So that is a particularly interesting scenario because the students 
may have thought that they were there to provide food, for example, for civilians, but instead they end up doing CPR and having to do first aid because this is a crisis zone. Applied role-playing games focus on particular educational, therapeutic, professional, or well-being goals. And these goals may focus on one or more of the following levels. So it could be at the personal level, just one's individual experience, the relational level, one's connection with other people, the structural level, so how one connects to the structures of society, or the cultural level. And applied role-playing games take elements from the leisure activity and apply them to specific settings. So they may focus, for example, on practicing specific skills through experiential learning and behavioral rehearsal. Um, so role-playing games are flexible enough to train sc several skills at once, including multiple types of cognitive, affective, and behavioral learning. And we'll get into that a little bit more later, but essentially because role-playing is an activity where many things are happening at the same time, a lot of different kinds of learning can also transpire. So here are some examples of the ways that role-playing game designers can innovate existing role-playing practices. So they can add fantastical elements or other purely fictional contents. They can further develop characters and relations between them. So creating more complex uh, character story arcs and things like that. Creating more narrative complexity, introducing combat systems such as buffer fighting that can be effective, particularly when working with young people, including mechanics that represent various physical, mental, and emotional phenomena. So making uh, into a mechanic something that otherwise might be difficult or intangible. And integrating more immersive settings, costumings, costuming and props. So if people have been involved in a very immersive LARP scene where they are into this 360 degree immersion, meaning trying to make the environment as true to uh, the setting as possible, perhaps they can bring some of those skills into the professional sphere. And they can afford players with more narrative agency outside of training one specific skill or learning one specific thing. It gives them more meaningful choices. So um, an example of uh, a LARP that has been imbued with some of these elements in an educational setting is Magiskolan, which is a Harry Potter-esque educational LARP in drama and other subjects, because like I said, other subjects can be taught at the same time. And this was by Leiverkstaden in Sweden. Okay, so let's talk about educational role-playing games next. So we're transitioning from talking about leisure and applied role-playing games, and then specifically thinking about games that are designed for educational purposes. So the term EduLARP uh, is what we're gonna focus on today, uh, even though some of the things we're gonna talk about also certainly apply to tabletop. EduLARP is used to describe many different live action role-playing activities for students of all ages. And I'm just gonna give you a handful here to show you the range of the different kinds of activities that may sound very different from each other, but are considered EduLARPs. So a LARP by Center Post designed to teach adults about the experiences of Belarusians during World War II, a peace demonstration LARP for a history class held at Osterskov Efterskol, one of the two Danish schools taught almost entirely through EduLARP. So there are two, two schools in uh, Denmark that um, students can go and it's a boarding school basically and all of their courses in, infuse, are infused with LARP in some way. So they do a LARP a week. They may learn in some other traditional manners, but, but LARP is the main modality for education. Other examples include a science fiction game by Leiverkstaden, who also work with youth in Sweden, designed to help students practice English. A role-playing game to help young adults design their careers called Singaland in Singapore and Idaland in the US. And here on the side, you can see a Singaland character sheet. And the idea here is for people to actually plot out their actual 
themselves um, and their their levels of skills, and then to to play within this game and see how their careers might be uh, designed moving forward. A Detective LARP by Seekers Unlimited for a middle school science class in California. So using this detective scenario to try to teach principles of science. And then Prisoner for a Day, a LARP where Norwegian students were brought to a real prison from World War II to live a, a day in the life of prisoners and to learn about human rights and history. So this is a game where you're, they're not necessarily practicing any skills other than perhaps empathy. So the use of role-playing games in education can take many forms. So in some cases, people will bring an existing role-playing game into an educational setting without adaptation. So um, that existing role-playing game may not have been designed to be an edulark, for example, but it's being brought into this educational setting and maybe it's not being changed, but there are these framing activities that are happening around it that make it more educational, such as, you know, uh, prompting people to be thinking about specific types of content or, or rehearsing that content ahead of time, or using the debrief to um, create a space for reflection so that they can think about certain, certain learning objectives uh, over others. And then, uh, Designers can also adapt existing RPGs to fit into new educational structures and curricular learning objectives. So taking a concept or perhaps a setting and then applying it um, to a new design that is specific to that class's goals. And then designing brand new RPGs to specific uh, to target specific learning objectives. So oftentimes there will be situations where um, a school will ask uh, LARP designers to create a topic for a specific part of their curriculum. And here are some examples from uh, Katrine Genois's wonderful paper in the International Journal of Role-Playing, which I highly recommend reading. Uh, these are just a few examples of games that she has helped design uh, in the STARS curriculum, which uh, includes 16 LARPs in German schools for various subjects. So the first one is for social science and it's called Europe the Band. And this is for students ages 14 and up. And it's meant to teach democracy, European history and conflict solving. In physics, there's time agents for ages 10 to 14. And this was meant to teach gravity and recoil. For German as a foreign language, uh, students played a game called Space Journey, ages 10 to 12. And this was about creating an appreciation for native or first languages and linguistic diversity. And then for a geography class, the party, ages 14 and up. And this uh, helped teach argumentative strategies and conflict solving within a time constraint. And then for a drama class, they played Rumpelstiltskin, ages eight through 10. And um, this is about learning about fairy tales, but also learning about agency. So as you can see, not only is this a large range of different types of classes, but also that they're learning multiple things at the same time. So in 2014, I put together a literature review of what I could find of the existing literature on educational LARP for specifically. Um, obviously, the field has expanded quite a bit since then, but I just wanted to give you a sense of um, just some of the skills that can be trained uh, in EduLARPs. And what, what I would say is that given the right design, role-playing games can be adapted to teach virtually any subject because they can train multiple skills at once. And if the right design is there, then the content can be adapted to this game frame. So here we have uh, three different learning dimensions and these overlap quite a bit. Um, some might say that the distinctions are somewhat artificial, but I think in terms of categorizing, it can be really helpful to kind of put things into certain, certain buckets in order to make sense of them. So I have one category that I call cognitive skills, and this is more about um, the way using the brain in particular ways, um, thinking activities. And some examples of student development that have been reported 
for edulorps are critical ethical reasoning, exercising creativity, spontaneity, and imagination, intrinsic motivation, so motivation that's coming from us rather than uh, demanded from us, improved problem-solving skills, again, learning multiple skills and knowledges simultaneously, and then self-efficacy or perceived confidence. So this idea of actually uh, being good at doing something and having the agency and authority to be able to do things well. And one thing I wanted to note about um, learning knowledge uh, during play, it's often best to teach the knowledge that you want uh, students to engage with beforehand um, so that once they encounter it in the LARP, it's not the only time that they have access to that knowledge because they may be, like I said, engaging in lots of different activities. Um, they may be really focused on giving a really strong rhetorical debate, uh, but you know maybe they didn't learn that particular topic as well as, as we would have hoped. So priming them beforehand and then also reinforcing the knowledge afterwards through more traditional types of learning. So there's affective skills. These are uh, emotional skills, um, active engagement, um, enhanced awareness of other people's perspectives. We talked about this with perspective taking. That first person identification, which improves emotional investment and can increase both empathy and self-awareness. So it can help us feel uh, more empathy for other people, but can also help us be more aware of our own selves in certain ways that might not have been possible if we hadn't stepped into character. Again, intrinsic motivation is also affective. It's a feeling um, raising social consciousness. So perhaps engaging in a LARP might make somebody more passionate about a certain social issue or more aware of it because they have that first person identification, not of having lived that life. Of course, we don't actually live the lives of our characters in the same way that uh, somebody with that lived experience uh, does, but at the very least, perhaps opening a space where we might be able to imagine what they're going through. And then uh, social skills development, such as cooperation, debate, and negotiation. We're going to talk about that also under behavioral skills. So behavioral skills um, connects to behaviors that we would like people to, to, to engage in. So things that we would like to incentivize. We often call these pro-social activities. Um, things like uh, exercising leadership skills, intrinsic motivation again, and improving teamwork. And there's a lot more of these to come. I'm actually coding quite a bit of data that uh, from experts in the field. And um, yes, the, the list will, will continue, so stay tuned. All right, uh, therapeutic role-playing games. This is slightly different. I would say that educational games often have more of a cognitive dimension, whereas therapeutic games are more uh, affective. But again, there's tons of overlap uh, in, in these types of games and in these types of activities. So role-playing games can be considered cousins to other therapeutic modalities that use storytelling and or role enactment. And so these things can be things like psychodrama or sociodrama, playback theater, experiential therapy, therapy gestalt practices, narrative therapy, internal family systems, which is this idea that there's multiple parts within the self that um, are in interaction with each other, like a family. And one of those parts, for example, might be an inner child. So working with, with someone with their inner child. And then there's family constellations, which is this practice where they will um, embody and have others in the group embody parts of their actual family as they remember it. And those, those, they'll, they'll create a sculpture essential, essentially where people will be standing in certain kinds of evocative ways that, that illustrate the dynamic in the family. And then the, the participant might be able to move things around and that might be therapeutic. So there's drama therapy, there's shadow work. So again, working with parts that we don't normally want anyone to see or even want to acknowledge within ourselves. There's adventure therapy and there's person-centered therapy. 
and uh, similar to playback theater, uh, it's important to note that it can also be a form of community activism, including things like theater of the oppressed. And um, we're not gonna get too much into that, but I do wanna make sure that we note uh, that very important development. So as we were talking about, uh, a therapeutic view of role-playing games tends to acknowledge the self as psychodynamic, meaning composed of parts or configurations of self. Um, so this can be a little bit challenging for some people to consider the idea that their role-playing character is actually a part of themselves. And certainly we absorb things from our um, environment and our characters can kind of be uh, imbued with those things, such as things from pop culture or people that we know. Um, but the idea here is there are parts of the self that are emerging that are um, authentic and, and, and within the person that are making themselves known through play. So we frame therapeutic role playing as a transformational container. And uh, transformational container is something that can hold a transformational process. So, and it needs to feel secure enough, this holding environment, meaning that it doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to feel like it's secure enough not to break essentially. And this is a space of playful experimentation where more authentic expressions of self can emerge. And it's usually, as I said before, held by professionals or paraprofessionals who help participants actually process this experience. So it's a little bit of a step further uh, from a lot of leisure games and even educational games in that there's this expectation um, and often agreement of one-on-one -on -one or group processing after the experience or during or even before. So pre preparation around that um, and the goal to have some sort of emotional growth as a result. So role-playing games can support other therapeutic processes that occur parallel to play before or after, meaning that uh, somebody can be in one-on-one -on -one or group therapy um, or engage in journaling or debriefing and having those things going on um, on the side while they're also playing in these game sessions. And that, that is a very therapeutic way of doing things because it allows whatever merges from play to then be part of the processing. So therapeutic role-playing games are grouped according to the goals of the client and the therapist. So there's these agreed upon goals usually between client and therapist um, before they even go into these sessions. Um, so for example, they're agreeing upon the types of activities that are expected to take place. So for example, the ratio of playfulness to processing time, meaning how much um, are we going to be playing and how much are we gonna be talking about our feelings? Um, the degree to which therapeutic modalities will be introduced in play, or will they just supplement it? And here, what I'm talking about is um, there are some games that the, the play itself is the goal. So just engaging in a state of playfulness and connecting with other humans is the goal. And there are other times where play is used to get to a specific spot where they can introduce a therapeutic modality. So for example, you know, being on a Dungeons and Dragons adventure and then halfway through, we're gonna practice mindfulness before we enter the dungeon, or we're gonna practice a dialectical behavioral therapy in uh, practicing interacting with other people. Um, so this is an, a, an using the game as a vehicle for um, these modalities to take place. And what I've heard from, from certain therapists is that for some clients, um, change and development can happen much faster this way because of uh, basically the playfulness allows for them to, to imagine different ways of being and, and behaving other than their own. So the types of support that are agreed upon between the therapist and the client are also a big part of therapeutic role-playing games. So as I mentioned before, any experience can be therapeutic in the sense that one might experience personal growth or processing as a result of it, but there's a, an expectation of support here that is, an, um, is part of therapeutic role-playing games. So again, the amount of processing between the therapist and the client that will occur before 
during or after a game. And this is sometimes established by a legal contract or by an ethical code. So um, there may be an expectation that someone will hold that participant through that process in a much more structured way than we would expect from people in a leisure role-playing community. So again, um, I'm going to give you some types of therapeutic role-playing games. There's a lot of crossover between these and a lot of the therapist groups that I'm talking about, they will engage in all three of them or some of them. So um, hopefully this will help us have a sense of the distinctions between these, but again, there's a lot of crossover. So the first group uh, is basically centered around therapy itself. So games that are designed to support therapeutic goals, such as trauma processing and other mental health challenges. Uh, the games may be run by a therapist themselves or they may be in collaboration with the client's therapist. So the therapist might um, uh, commission a LARP or a tabletop game for somebody to play in order to be part of their therapeutic process. In games that are designed for therapy, there are high expectations of emotional processing before, during, or after. So um, this, like I said, more one-on-one -on -one time or other types of processing. An example here is the Bodhana Group, uh, a nonprofit in the US. They run interventions for the therapeutic treatment of sexual abuse, trauma from grief, for example, from the loss of a relative, these kinds of things. So they're, they're working directly with um, people with these backgrounds, and in some cases, even with agreement between the clients and the therapists and, and, and this group, um, they're using the fiction in order to process these things. So actually injecting the fiction with these themes, not necessarily sexual abuse, but, but uh, in, the, in the case that I'm thinking of trauma from grief. So, um, you know, helping children, for example, move through loss through narrative structures. So there are social skills groups, and these are games that are designed to support social developmental goals, such as learning how to make friends, communication skills, conflict resolution, and other forms of behavioral rehearsal. And so again, these may be contracted from an outside group as an adjunct to therapy, or they may be run by therapists. And there are medium expectations of emotional processing in social skills groups uh, before, during, and after. So for example, there's Game to Grow, who are a nonprofit in the US, and they, uh, these games are run by trained therapists, but they're often focusing on social skills within these groups, um, including working with neurodiverse populations. Although I would say that all of these uh, groups that I'm talking about work with neurodiversity uh, to some degree. And um, so when I say medium expectations of emotional processing, it may be the case that a game gets paused um, or at the end of uh, a game, there may be a discussion about feedback about the way a player uh, presented themselves in game through their character. Perhaps there's some sort of conversation about how that the other people in the group responded to that. And that is uh, pretty normal in these groups, but it doesn't necessarily take up a large amount of time. So Game to Grow have developed their own role-playing game. Uh, it's a system called Critical Core. And according to their uh, website, it guides players to build self -co uh, social confidence, build communication and collaboration skills, develop frustration tolerance and emotional tolerance, and also learn to care for others. So some of these things are, are quite practical and other things are maybe more uh, on the emotional end of things, uh, but uh, all of these things can be accessed through role-playing games. And then the third category is recreation. And these are games designed with an emphasis on the importance of the activity itself as therapeutic rather than specific goals to achieve or skills to learn. Um, an example of this uh, is recreational therapy. Recreational therapy can refer to lots of different creative activities or recreational activities, um, but here we're specifically talking about role-playing games. 
And in recreation, there is low or no expectations of emotional processing before, during, or after, because the activity itself is the point. So an example is RPG Therapeutics, uh, which is a US company that works with clients with a variety of disabilities and psychological challenges. Um, they run all three of these types of groups. They may run a, a intense therapy session for one client. They may run a social skills group, or they might just run a recreation group. And some examples of the recreation groups uh, that Hawk Robinson has told me about, who is there, um, the leader of that group. Uh, running LARPs for children with muscular dystrophy to improve physical and psychological well-being. So getting them out there to, 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 to be physical, tire themselves out and have fun and feel empowered. Um, and they also travel to various sites with a wheel, wheelchair accessible trailer and run tabletop games for disabled clients who wouldn't necessarily have that kind of mobility uh, otherwise. And so this is an accessibility uh, intervention. Okay, so to thumb up, how can role players maximize the potential for transformation? So regardless of the type of transformative role-playing game, the keys to success for any transformative process are reflection and processing. Goal setting before and after can also be helpful but keep in mind that role-playing games are unpredictable in their impacts as a result of this emergent play. So you might design a game with a specific goal in mind, but people are going to uh, run with it as they will and may have completely other things that they're working with that end up becoming super important to them. And they may miss that particular goal, but something really important happened uh, that needs to be explored. So there can be this intentionality that we have that becomes important at all of the stages. So during design, implementation, and play that can help groups steer towards certain transformative impacts. So the more intentional we are, the more that we can guide play in specific directions. And the perception of safety is important to establish and maintain in role-playing communities. Uh, we have a five-part safety uh, set up ser series of safety lectures for, for you to dive more deeply into this, but just to, uh, in general, safety allows participants to lower their vigilance and to surrender more deeply to playfulness as a central part of the transformative process. And what I mean here by lower their vigilance and surrender more deeply, it's not that uh, they are somehow mindless in this experience um, or that they've lost their agency, uh, quite the opposite. There's in, oftentimes more of a state of awareness that's happening and more of a state of empowerment. But there's something about feeling safe that allows people to, to feel like they can fully take part, they can fully opt in. Similarly, safety necessitates enthusiastic consent so this ability to opt in and opt out, as well as calibration and other forms of negotiation and self-advocacy. So being able to not only opt into the activity or opt out, but also to be able to negotiate for one's needs um, yeah, in the group. And uh, we'll talk a lot more about this in other videos, but I just wanted to say very briefly, Role-playing games add some extra affordances um, that are important. And here are a couple terms from role-play theory. So there's alibi, which is permission to behave in ways that otherwise might feel risky or socially unacceptable. Alibi allows participants to feel more confident taking risks and even failing as a part of the learning process. So there are a lot of activities that we might be afraid to do because we're afraid to fail, but we can try them in a game because the consequences are less dire and it's not really us doing it, it's our character. At least that's what we say. And then there's bleed, which is sort of a um, counterpoint to that in that there's this spillover from the player to the character and vice versa in some cases. And the spillover can be emotions, thought processes, physical states, relationships, personality traits, even um, paradigmatic belief systems, things like that. And when that 
happens, then there's this porousness uh, in this magic circle of play. And there are things that, that um, can be carried in or carried out with us if we use bleed intentionally, meaning bleed itself can be a very unconscious process. It isn't necessarily something that we um, always know when it's happening or what's coming up, why it's happening. But once it is happening, we can steer towards certain bleed experiences, or we can, um, you know, use that distill some treasure from that basically and bring it out with us. Um, so here we have an, a diagram that envisions role-playing as a transformational container. And so we have the daily self, the daily identity. And I put this in quotes because um, it is often a role that we play and it may ne not necessarily represent all of us. And then we have these goals, these agreements, transparency, consent, safety structures, and community support. And that gives us a lot of alibi, which allows us to bleed in certain aspects from our daily life if we'd like, um, perhaps uh, use intention and playfulness in order to um, drive play with these goals. And so going into play, you're playing this alter ego or this character within this magic circle. And you've made these agreements with this social contract that allows it to be permissible to behave in ways that we wouldn't normally behave. And then maybe something special is learned there. And then either we experience bleed out. So it emotionally impacts us out, outside of the game, or there's some sort of transfer that occurs, maybe knowledge that's gained within this magic circle then comes out and is integrated into to one's daily life in some way. But the idea here is that the, the identity can shift, meaning our sense of self can shift as a result of these kinds of transformational experiences. And often what can help support that are, again, having goals, uh, processing and reflection, and then taking meaningful actions on our goals. So it's not enough to simply have had a, a really interesting experience at a game or a really profound experience at a game. Sometimes it's taking action to, to move forward uh, to make change more concrete. And then again, that is supported by safety structures and community support. So as I mentioned before, our view of transformation is inherently progressive. So we are interested in transformative impacts that um, are, are undertaken for the betterment of the self and also for the group. And some takeaways here, role-playing games can be transformative, creating space for players to experience personal and social development, learn various cognitive, affective, and behavioral skills, as well as practice using subject matter knowledge, and then also engage in therapeutic processes that can improve relationships, mental health, and overall well being. And here is my reference list. This is just a handful of sources um, that I used in this presentation. There's a lot more. I definitely recommend diving in. And if you would like to get in touch with me, again, I'm Sarah Lynn Bowman at the Department of Games Design at Uppsala University, and I'm part of the Transformative Play Initiative. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day.